Uh, we're very honoured to have with us uh, Professor Chris Mackey from Macquarie University. Um, most of you might know Professor Mackey from um, last year, who was also kind enough to deliver um, a talk as part of the series. Just want to give a few words on Professor Mackey's sort of background. Initially, he started studying um, Latin and Greek at the University of Newcastle. Later on, he did his um, PhD at the University of Glasgow. Um, at the moment, he's the head of school, the School of Historical and European Studies at Montreal University. Uh, for quite a while, I think 24 years, he was at the University of Melbourne and has been at Montreal since uh, 2010. Um, he's published prolifically in various um, academic journals and other publications. Um, I won't go through that list, but when I look at his academic profile, um, what stood out for me is that his um, PhD dissertation was on Virgil's Aeneid, uh, if I'm correct. Um, and I don't want to preempt things, but I know most of us here, all of us here, are probably familiar with Virgil's Aeneid, but it's highly unlikely that we know more about Virgil's Aeneid than we do about his Iliad and Odyssey. And there is a connection between Greek and Roman laws there. So without preempting things, maybe that could be a possible lecture for next year, Professor Mackey. So uh, we don't have a five-year program in such a series, but we do like to plan ahead. So, yeah. um, tonight's lecture by Professor Mackey um, will be on Judgment of Paris, a passage in Homer's uh, Iliad, and other similar sort of um, episodes. But I won't keep you too long. Um, a big hand of applause for Professor Mackey, please. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, as Nick mentioned, I'm a graduate uh, of the University of Glasgow, where I did my PhD. And Glasgow was the University of Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin's looking at me over there, I take it Lord Kelvin. So, um, Things work in strange ways. I didn't think I'd ever give a lecture in, um, um, in, in Melbourne anyway with, uh, with Lord Kelvin. Um, but uh, thank you for having me, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, as you know, I can see some Latrobe people, Chris Beepus and Stephanie Belulis and the others. Latrobe uh, still uh, values Greek studies, and they're trying to build an ancient and modern program. It's a, very hard thing in today's academic context, but that's what we're, we're doing. I'm uh, talking to Maria Rodotu uh, earlier today. We've got a, a conference in late November on Kazantzakis and Givafi, so um, that's I think the 21st and 22nd of November. So um, we, we would love to see all of you involved. Um, two great writers and uh, be fantastic if, uh, if you could come to, to some of these. Um, I'm on the dark side of uh, university life these days. I uh, run a school of about 70 people, so I don't get much of a chance to, uh, to talk about my research interests. Um, this particular topic was something that uh, I worked on just as I was leaving Melbourne University and um, coming to La Trobe University, such as the strange nature of academic publishing that I've pretty much finished the article uh, in about 2011, and it's coming out in an uh, academic journal in, uh, in about a month's time in Britain, a journal called Classical Quarterly. I'll give you a reference later in case you're interested. So it's, it's, um, it's been an article that I've been very fond of, uh, and it concerns, as the title suggests, uh, Iliad 24. The Judgment of Paris, I'm sure you're all very well acquainted with. I'll run through it anyway in a, in a moment, but uh, here is a, a representation. It's obviously the, the ancient beauty contest. And by the way, please excuse my Anglo pronunciations of, um, of uh, Greek names, um, where you've got Paris on the right there with his lyre, and then you've got the three goddesses, uh, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera. Um, and this is, a, this is a mythical event that's so important um, 
you, you can scarcely think of anything more important in the whole story of Troy. I mean, you might want to think of the myth of Troy as the central uh, Greek narrative or in their large mythological corpus. Um, and, of course, it all starts with the judgment of Paris because, uh, well, I'll run through the story in a minute, okay. um, I think I've got this right. So the main elements, this is for in case you're not familiar with this, um, is that um, there's, as you know, if you've been to many weddings, if you're ever going to find trouble, it'll be at a wedding. Um, and this is what happens in the story of Peleus and Thetis, the mother and the father of uh, father and mother of, uh, of Achilles, where there is trouble. Now, there's various versions of this, as always, there are many versions of Greek myths. Um, but um, in some cases there's an apple rolled into the wedding that says, for the most beautiful, and the, the goddesses Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite um, put their hands up to be the, the most beautiful, uh, and um, there's a, a bit of scrum, I suppose, of, of goddesses, and the decision is made um, to decide that the beauty contest be set up um, on Mount Ida, of all places, uh, with Paris, of all people, as the judge. Um, and um, Paris, as you know, is bribed by all three, the great ancient tradition of bribing judges, and um, <laughs> he's bribed by all three, by Athena, uh, by Aphrodite, um, the Athena right. victory in war, Aphrodite, us uh, here are usually... Um, kingly power and so forth, and, and um, of course Aphrodite bribes him with the, the, the beautiful Helen, who unfortunately married to Menelaus of Sparta and so forth. Now he chooses Aphrodite on the promise of having Helen as his wife. And I sometimes talk with students about what is this myth saying about men? Um, possibly nothing very good, um, but um, that's, that's um, maybe it's... Um, yeah, well, I won't. I'll leave it to you to decide what you think this myth is saying about men. To, it shows you where their preferences lie, I suppose. Um, I, last year, I, I talked about uh, the connection between the European side of the Dardanelles and Troy. Remember, those of you who were here, um, the, way, the way that, uh, obviously, the, <coughs> the, the ancient setting and the fact that uh, Greece was... Uh, uh, this region was obviously part of the Greek speaking world. But here's Mount Ida here. Um, Kazdag in Turkish. Uh, and so it's 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 actually a long way away from what we think is, is Troy. Um, but you read the Iliad um, and it seems like Troy is just just there, just right behind the city and so forth. Um, but in actual fact, I, I've been there a, a couple of times. It's a particularly beautiful part of the world. You know, in the summer it's really nice and cool and so forth. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good location. So... Um, uh, that's the region, Mount Ida. So I'm going to be talking a, a little bit about Mount Ida uh, to, in, this, in this paper. Um, so my interest in this, what's my interest in this story? Um, my interest in this story is linked to a lot of other, you, you probably know, if you Regardless of how much you know about the story of Troy, you'll probably identify a, a number of um, key narratives. The Wooden Horse, uh, The Rape of Cassandra, um, The Death of the Stonex Thrown from the Wards, uh, you know, the whole heap of them that you will, you will know about. And I suppose what kind of interested me at the beginning is you've got this most famous myth, you've got this, this poem, the, the Iliad, dealing with a short period in the Trojan War, and yet there was no reference, or very, one small reference to that particular narrative of the judgment of Paris. And, and the fact that there are so many other 
story, key stories that don't seem to appear in the poem. And we know that Homer was a very, I, I told a group of students, I think yesterday or the day, this word, he's a very radical poet. Homer was a very radical poet in taking away a lot of what must have been key traditional narratives. Um, let me give you an example of one that I wrote on many years ago, and that is the figure of Cairo and the centaur. And some of you know that uh, Achilles was brought up in Thessaly by Cairo and the centaur, half man, half horse. Um, Homer is a kind of poet who takes that whole story out of the children. Just a couple of little mentions of it, but basically that whole narrative is cast out. Why does he do that? He does that because he's the kind of poet that doesn't want monsters or hybrids in his poem. He, he's creating a world, the world, should we call it the world of Achilles, where the focus is very much on the human form. Notice that Achilles acquires his her heroic, what, what we call kleos, excellence or reputation. He, he acquires that through victory in war, through, through martial... Um, achievements. And yet most other heroes in the Greek tradition uh, like Heracles and Perseus and Jason and so forth acquire their heroic excellence by confronting monsters and doing all sorts of things like that. So I think we want to be thinking about a, uh, the poet Homer of the, I realise there are all sorts of questions about who, who was Homer and was there one Homer or many Homers and all sorts of things like that but let's just, let's just call him Homer for the sake of of, of the, the, the talk and say, I, I think he's a very radical poet who takes out a lot of stuff. And there is no reference to the wooden horse. There is at least, as we'll see, there is at least one reference to the judgment of Paris. There's no reference to the wooden horse. Um, there's no reference to the rape of Cassandra. There's, there's you know, all those other things, that, atrocities that went on. Um, but I'm going to suggest to you that Homer has a, a, a kind of a lo an elusive style. He doesn't take these narratives out completely. He just gives you a little hint here and there. Because like you as an audience, people must have come to these, um, to these performances in, shall we say, 700 BC, knowing the basic narratives that Homer is, uh, is giving to them. He, it's, it's, it's a bit like a going to the theatre of Athens in 430 BC, that you know who Medea is, you know who Antigone is, you know who Ajax is, and so forth. And therefore, the scope for little allusions and little references is so much stronger in that, in that context. And so there is one reference to the Judgment of Paris story in the whole, in the whole Iliad, and that got me kind of thinking... Book 24, I should say, is my favourite book of the Iliad. I think it's just the most wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and it, it does so much in a short space of time, and, and so it's, it really has some amazing things going on. Let me, let me run through some of the, the key things about Book 24. Then. At the beginning of Book 24, Apollo and Hera are squabbling over the treatment of uh, Hector's body. Uh, Hector has been killed by Achilles and Achilles is mutilating the body and has been for the best part of a thousand lives. Let me just remind you in case you didn't know that Homer didn't create this poem in books. It was created hundreds and hundreds of years later in the Alexandrian tradition where uh, clearly it's, it's, it's better to have papyri and you know, one, one or two books per papyrus and so forth. So it's, it, it, Homer just creates his poem and it's later traditions that divide it up into 24 books according to uh, 24 letters of the alphabet, alphabet to gamma and so forth. So it's, um, Homer doesn't create book 24 but that's why we, we, we think of it. Uh, so there's a kind of continuity and some people say what's the matter whether it's book 24 or whether it's the end of the year. But I think there are times when you're reading through that really gives a different sense if you don't think of it as Book 24. But anyway, in our tradition, it's, it's Book 24. And they're squabbling over Achilles' treatment of the body of Hector. And Achilles, as we all know, uh, has treated this, this guy's body abominably. 
And Apollo, who is a god of, um, you know, of moderation, or a god who, who's linked to ideas of proper behavior and all these sorts of things, is appalled. But here is this guy being dragged around um, with the hope that, presumably, from, uh, as far as Achilles is concerned, that he will deface him, presumably, and take away the memory of Hector as he was, this sort of beautiful youth kind of stuff like that. Um, the gods, of course, protect the body, and therefore no defacement uh, occurs. Um, but still, the treatment is there, and um, the Greek gods, they, they have their faults, and they do um, behave rather badly themselves from time to time, as we all know. Zeus is a, hardly a shining light in, in this regard. But they don't condone atrocities like the behaviour of Achilles here. Achilles, of course, is such an intense individual in everything he does. Um, his loves and his hates. And in Book 24, you get this remarkable transformation in him where he becomes remarkable for his compassion and remarkable for his altruism. Um, almost to the extent where he doesn't seem like a Greek hero because the Greek heroes of the Iliad are so self-focused and so um, egos the size of football fields, you might say. And here is this guy who is about to die saying to Priam, I'm getting ahead of myself, but saying to Priam, the king of Troy, now how long do you need to, to, to bury your son, to, to go through the practice of the funeral of, of Hector? Uh, and he says, oh, well, we need 12 days and so forth. And, and then Philly says, well, okay, we'll hold up the fighting, the fighting for 12 days so that you can go through, so you can bury your, your son and so forth. That is remarkable. I mean, you follow that poem all the way through. And it's remarkable for anyone to, to, to make that sort of altruistic gesture. Um, but it's particularly remarkable, given what we've seen of Achilles. This guy has been on a roller coaster ride um, throughout the entire poem, and then all of a sudden here he is making a gesture like that. So, um, but just one final, th uh, before I move on to the next slide. Remember, it's called the Iliad, it's not called the Achilleid. Um, and I sometimes ask my students about this, and what does that actually mean? Um, it's called the Iliad after Ilios, Troy, the Greek man for Troy. And so that raises all sorts of questions uh, about who the hero is. It asks, you know, where is the principal focus? And in fact, what happens in the Iliad is the, the death of Achilles, the imminent death of Achilles after the end of the poem, and the imminent death of Troy after the end of the poem, are really fundamentally linked in all sorts of ways. So don't forget, I mean, we call it the Odyssey, and the, the ancients called it the Odyssey after Odysseus. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh after Gilgamesh, the Aeneid after, after Aeneas, and so forth. He goes through all those epic traditions. Jason and the Argonauts, and so forth, the Argonautica. But it's not called that in, in the Iliad. It's, it's, it's focused around the city of Troy. And um, in some ways, the king of Troy is the great hero in Book 24. So, some gods want to get Hermes to steal um, the body away to give it back to the Trojans. Hermes is a god associated with theft, of course, and all that sort of thing. Um, but the other three gods are very hostile to this. So Hera, Poseidon, and Athena won't, won't have that. Um, and so my favourite image, when I first went to the, the Parthenon in about 1974, they used to have postcards with this image uh, on. Uh, yeah, I was struck by it then. It's in Crete. Uh, Corfu, rather. Um, so this is the reference to... Um, to the judgment of Paris and the Iliad. This is all we get. Um, uh, and this, the, and the stealing away of Hec uh, Hector's body was pleasing to all the other gods, but never to Hera, nor to Poseidon, nor the flashing-eyed maiden, that's um, Athena, um, but they remain, remain hostile to sacred Ilios, it's sacred because Zeus's son, Dardanus, started Troy. Um, 
as in the beginning, and to Priam and to his people, because of Paris' folly, he who insulted the goddesses when they came to his inner courtyard and praised her who provided his grievous lust. That's all you get, the only reference you get to the to the judgment of Paris. And it's really troubled people. Um, before I forget, one of the things that's really troubled people is the fact that you've got Hera, okay, judgment of Paris, missed out on the beauty contest. Now, no one likes to be judged second or third, so she, you can see why she hates Troy. Um, and Athena, the flashing-eyed maiden, you can see why she hates Troy, because Paris didn't pick her either. What the earth's he doing there in the middle of them? And the answer to that, as for those of you who know your Greek, Greek myths, is that Poseidon helped build the walls of Troy for Priam's father, Laomedon, and uh, he didn't get paid at the end of building those walls. And, and maybe there are some residences there. Um, he, he didn't get paid. I once um, did some work on the island of um, uh, Kos, uh, picking tomatoes. I didn't get paid either. So I was... But he didn't get paid, and that's why he hates Troy uh, uh, as well. Um, but that, to, to sort of... In the analytical scholarly tradition, there's a whole lot of major uh, work still being done on Homer. Um, this, this, this is the sort of thing that academics pick on to say, well, is this a genuine passage, or is this um, something that somebody cooked up in the hundreds of years after the, um, you know, if we date Homer to around about 700 BC, then, you know, when... when might this have been put in at a later date? In fact, there is a there are question marks over the whole of Book 24 of the people of Rome. I think it's absolutely crazy because it's, it's such a powerful and genuine book in all sorts of ways. It seems to me, but you know, people do do um, raise questions about it. So it's pretty clear they want Hermes to steal the body away, but the three, these are three powerful gods. Remember, as I often tell my students, the Trojan War is deemed as such a, a, a powerful and such an important war because it's, it's a cosmic conflict and the gods are divided up over who they're going to support. And this trio of gods here, Hera, Poseidon and Athena, is a pretty powerful trio of gods, representing, of course, the fact that Troy is going to get smashed and these gods are going to help in the smash. Um, and and that's, you know, Nick mentioned earlier the, the Aeneid, that... That's what anchors the Aeneid too, because even even then in the uh, in the Roman tradition, the idea is that Hera or Juno um, hates Troy just as much as and, uh, in a different poem as, as she does in the, the Iliad. Um, and notice the reference here to Mount Ida. Paris, when he makes this judgment, is working as a kind of royal shepherd. There is this tradition in the the, the sort of Trojan myth, the, the myths about Troy, um, of individuals, individual royal youth, working as shepherds or herdsmen. There's another famous story, of course, of Anchises, who has a sexual tryst with Aphrodite, which produces Aeneas. And strange things happen when you're sitting up there on a cave in... Um, on Mount Ida. And, and so here we have a reference. So you've got the reference to the judgment of Paris, um, and you've got a reference to um, to the location of this in, in Mount Ida. And it's the very beginning of Book 24, really. I mean, 25. Okay, so some of the issues are from the time of Aristarchus in that scholarly uh, Alexandrian tradition. Separatist scholars <coughs> have had concerns about the passage and condemned it as non-Homeric, whatever that means. Um, and some later scholars in the 1950s and 1960s, especially in Germany and Britain, um, argued for its authenticity 
on the basis that it was a, an appropriate narrative to refer uh, to at the end of the poem, just as the city's about to meet its doom. So you've got people like Aristarchus, a sort of a very, obviously a very scholarly um, individual in, in, uh, in uh, the Alexandrian uh, tradition, and uh, and then in the 50s and 60s, you're starting to get scholars saying, well, hang on a minute, maybe, you know, maybe we're, we're, we've got this. And Carl Reinhardt, who's a very distinguished Homeric scholar, says, without the judgment of Paris, um, there could be no Iliad. That's a big statement. Uh, and uh, and ev- every argument for the authenticity of the passage uh, considers its role and function in the Iliad as a whole. Um, and I suppose we could ask the question, why would the poet refer to the story here but not elsewhere? How does it fit into the major issues and thrust of the whole 24 books? And so I, as in a, in a traditional scholarly way, I suppose, read these articles and so forth and chapters in books and so forth. And I suppose what I was looking for is to say, well, OK, you can argue that this reference to the judgment of Paris is, is appropriate for the final book of the year. But what about what else is there in Book 24? And what I was trying to do was trying to look at how this reference fitted in with the things around it in the final book of the year. And that, so that's what I'm going to. So no one else can the reference within the context of the final book. Now, just a, a quick uh, literary history lesson for those of you who um, aren't familiar. Uh, I won't bother talking about these two. Um, but bear in mind, there must have, well, we know there was, many other poems about the Trojan War. The Iliad only deals with a short period in the Trojan War. Other poems took up the, 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 the saga. Other poems took up the various sections. Uh, as I used to try to example the other day, like Superman, where you've got Smallville and Metropolis and various stages of his, of his life and so forth. And likewise, in the life of Troy, um, you get different poems that say that the Iliad of Persis deals with the fall of Troy and so forth. So everybody has different, different um, focuses and so forth.